everybody to my talk, uh, Do You Still Need SAS in 2023? Um, we started. Um, a little bit more about me first before I start getting into the talk. My name is Aubrey Sambor. I am a lead engineer and a co-owner at Lullabot. All of us are co-owners because um, we have an employee-owned stock plan. So I think all of us today who have been speaking have put co-owner in our uh, titles. So <laughs> wanted to like keep on going with the trend. And yeah, a lot of fun. Um, I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is about an hour and a half west of Boston. Um, there's not really a lot there. Northampton's kind of cool. Um, and I have been doing CSS now for about 25 years. I did it for the first time in 1998 when I wanted to remove my underlines from my links because I didn't like how they looked when I was 17 years old. <laughs> would not recommend doing that now because it is not accessible. So I would keep those links or keep those underlines, but I got into CSS that way. So at least there was that. Um, you can find me online in a couple places. I'm really active on Mastodon, and if you're on Mastodon, you can find me at starshaped at labyrinth.social. I have a blog at starshaped.org. I do a little bit of tech writing there, but I mainly write about music and things like that. And of course, I have an elliptical.org account, and I've been doing triple now since about 2009. So, yeah, been around since about triple six. <clears throat> uh, what will we talk about today? Uh, today I'm going to talk about an overview of the native CSS features that will replace, or that can replace, SAS functionality. I'm going to talk about using post-CSS to implement up-and-coming CSS features that aren't supported in all browsers. Um, ways to add native CSS to your SAS code so you can start using modern CSS today. And of course at the end, I am going to end, I'm going to end with a question, should you use SAS in 2023 and beyond? So first off, I'm going to talk about some of the new things that CSS can do um, as of 2023, and there's a little bit of 2022 as well in there, but things that you can do now that a lot of us have been waiting for for a while. First, I'm going to talk about custom properties. Um, they've been around in modern browsers since about 2016, so you probably use them. They're either called custom properties or CSS variables. You can hear them called both things. And you can use these in place of SAS variables. Um, a big reason why a lot of people use SAS is to be able to use variables. And now CSS has this built in, and that's pretty great. And I have a little bit of the syntax here. I don't know if this is too small. I'm probably going to need to blow these up a little bit. Um, but there's an example of how you use a custom property. And since they aren't compiled into CSS like SAS variables are, they can be changed on the fly using JavaScript. And this is another huge advantage of using these as opposed to SAS variables. <clears throat> you can't use custom properties in a media query, though. That is one thing that kind of gets me all the time, where I'm like, I just want to have a media query be a variable that I can use in many places. But right now, you can't do that. But there is a way with a post-CSS plugin that I will talk about later. And then I also have a code pen demonstrating how you can uh, change custom property values on fly using JavaScript. So I'll do that right now. And let me know if this is too small. I can blow this up a little bit to make it bigger. Uh, okay. And so this is basically just a big box with a button on the top that says change color. And I wrote some JavaScript uh, that will change the color of the box using CSS custom properties. Uh, my JavaScript, it's, this can probably be written better. Uh, JavaScript isn't my forte. I'm definitely more of a front on the front end developer. I'm concentrating more on CSS and accessibility. But this gets the job done for the demonstration I'm doing. So first off, I have this page styles that's right here that I'm creating. It's getting all of the um, document element items, which is also getting all the CSS custom properties, which I'm setting over here. I set the background color to be teal of this box um, when the page loads. And it's more teal. It looks kind of like turquoise on this monitor, but it's definitely teal. Then I added an event listener to the button to click to toggle the background. And I've got some more CSS down here that's getting the current background from that, the computer values that I had gotten. So I'm getting the property value of background color, which I have set over here to be teal. And then I've got some JavaScript that you know, if the background's teal, change it to pink. And so, 
what it's doing is changing this background color property in the CSS custom property to be pink instead of teal when I click this button. So now when I click this button, it'll turn pink. So that way you can update your CSS variables on the fly using JavaScript, and this is something you cannot do with SAS because SAS variables, again, are compiled beforehand. You can't change them after the fact. Next thing is math in native CSS. Um, yeah, CSS has the, the um, ability to do math. The one that most people have probably done a lot of is Calc, because Calc has been around for a really long time, probably over, over 10 years at this point. Um, but another new thing that just came in, I think, earlier this year is trigonome trigonometric functions, which is a hard word to say. So now, you can do cosine, sines, and tangents in your code if you need to do kind of fancy math things. Um, I didn't come up with a good good um, demo for this, but somebody else did, so I'm going to show you that because like, what can I write that's like a cosine or something? So, but I found this example on CSS tricks about cre creating a clock with these CSS sine and cosine trigonometry functions. I'll just show you the little bit that they're using to make this clock. They're making this clock right here um, using trigonometric functions. So this clock is built entirely in CSS. Even that second hand that's going around is using CSS animations. So it's a cool thing that you can actually go in CSS. And if I scroll down, you can see here. It's down here. Um, you can see the code here. Um, this code here is what's causing the, this is where you're, they're using the, um, the trigonometric functions. You can see that they're using, to, to position the x and y coordinates, they're using the cosine of the variable of the diameter and the sine of the variable of the diameter for both of these variables. And what this does is it allows you to place all the, all the uh, numbers around the clock in, a, in an order depending on what the diameter of this circle is. So this is a good example of why you would use these trigonometric functions. And it's cool that you can just do this in native CSS now. Uh, SAS actually has one too. Um, I can open up this, this example too, but this one's really complicated. There's a lot of like triangle stuff going on in here and cal like calculating the hypotenuse and all this stuff. So you're, you've always been able to do this in SAS, but now you can do all of this stuff in CSS too. So this is another reason, if you're doing a lot of this kind of stuff in your projects, you can just use native CSS for this now. Next up are color functions. Um, I'm focusing on color mix as one because color mix is fairly new to CSS and SAS has a mix function. The big thing I like to use color mix for is to mix, to light, kind of lighten or darken or tint, tint or shade a color, where I can mix it with white or black, depending on if I want to make it lighter or darker. And again, this is something that SAS does now with mix, and there's a slight difference between how color mix does it and how mix <coughs> does it in SAS. Whereas the percentage of the mix can be added to both, both values in color mix. And in SAS mix, you can only use one percentage number. And you can't use a CSS custom property in the SAS color functions. You have to use SAS variables because of how um, how the CSS variables are computed and SAS variables are calculating the computed value. So you're not able to do that. And I have some examples about how these work. And then I'm going to code them. Yeah. This. So this is um, this is an example of two divs. One is using a background color using color mix, and a background color using SAS mix. If you can't tell, both that both of them have a light pink background. It might be hard to tell on the screen, but both of them essentially look the same. But one is using SAS and one is using the CSS. And what I have in here is the variables being set both as the custom properties in the root. And I also have them as the SAS variables because unfortunately I'm not able to do something like this in line seven where I have the main color equaling the bar of the main color, like using the CSS custom property. You see I'm getting an error here. And the error is, if you can't read it, that the bar main color is not a color. 
And that's because at the time the SAS is being compiled, the CSS custom property hasn't really fully resolved. So you can't do that with some of these custom properties, and that is pretty frustrating because I wouldn't want I don't want to have to redeclare these two things. So this is just one little kind of irritation with doing things this way. And I can scroll down a little bit here and show CSS for the, the container CSS and for the container SAS. The top one is right here at the top at line 29. I'm using the CSS color mix, and you can see the main color, the pink, is at 15%, and the mixed color is the white at 85%. And I declared those again up at the top here, where the main color is pink and the mixed color is white. So I can add the percentage to both values here. This container stacks down here, um, it's just background mix. I want to mix the main color and the mixed color and the 15 with 15%. And the 15% is the only only kind of percentage value that I can pass. And that has and the 15% is applied to that main color. I only want 15% in the main color so that the, the background is lighter. So that's the difference between using the mix property in SAS and the um, container CSS uh, the color mix in the in here. So yeah, they're both the same. I was kind of playing around in here a little bit to show that you can't do like oh maybe I can just do background mix main color mix color. Maybe I can do it that way. Maybe if I pass the, SAS, the CSS custom properties directly into the mix, SAS mix variable, maybe that'll work. Nope, you see I get an error, so that still doesn't work. But I can, yeah, there's, I think that's all I really want to show here. Either way, you can use color mix in the same way as you were using the SAS mix if you were using this to lighten or darken or tint or shade your background colors or anything like that. So again, this is something, if you're using this a lot in SAS, and you're, that's the reason why you're using SAS, you can go ahead and move to custom CSS, or to use just CSS without SAS to do the same thing. Next up, and I feel like this is a big one because it's gotten a lot of movement recently, and I actually just had to, have, I just had to update this um, slide like earlier today because I noticed that the spec had changed. That's how fast the nesting is going. Um, right now, CSS nesting is supported in all browsers, in most recent versions of Chrome and Safari, and now Firefox in versions um, 117 and greater. And just today, when I looked, um, the syntax for, it used to be that in Safari and Chrome, the syntax for the nesting was, was, was different from Firefox, where if you had some nested element selectors, you had to put an ampersand before due, due to browser limitations in both Safari and Chrome. Firefox, you can just write nesting like you usually do in SAS. But when I looked today, when I was setting this up, I saw that Safari is now also following the Firefox convention, and you do not need to put that ampersand in um, before the element selectors. So yeah, and I think there's a Chrome, I think one of the nightly builds of Chrome, of Chromium, actually is going that way too. It just hasn't been released yet. So I'll have to update this again once that happens. <clears throat> and this is just an example of, it's so small. I can't make any bigger. This is an example of um, how the nesting works. You can see the first example is nesting that, this is how nesting works in Firefox and in Safari, where you do article, P, and then have the color in there. And I gotta update this. Um, and then in in Chrome still, you need to do the second option where you have to put that ampersand before the P to get that to actually work. And I have an example of this, and I will show you in all three different browsers so you can see how it works in all three browsers. So you can see um, how this ampersand thing is kind of still in action and in flux. And hopefully all the browsers will be the same pretty soon. <clears throat> All right, so this is nesting in native CSS, and this is in the most recent version of Firefox. You can see that I have my code down here. Uh, down here, at this list, list item, and span within the list item. You can see I, I wrote a supports that is giving you a nice, like, nice message that says that your browser supports nesting. 
if you if I was opening up an older version of Firefox, this yay, your browser supports nesting would be a green background that says no, sad, it doesn't support nesting. But since Firefox does, then you'll see this message. And then I've got five list items right below it. And you can see that each list item that's nested has the color of teal. But then I have a span at the end with the color of fuchsia. And since Firefox, you don't need to put the ampersand before the element selector, which is the span in this case, you'll see that that last list item is, is fuchsia like I wanted. If I fire up uh, Safari, it's the same thing. You'll see that, that last list item is fuchsia because it supports that um, not having that ampersand there. However, if I open up Chrome, you will see that this last list item is not fuchsia. And it's because the span here, like I said earlier, does not have an ampersand. If I do put the ampersand in here and wait a second, it turns fuchsia because it needs that ampersand. Again, I'm hoping that Safari or that Chrome releases their version that will, so that it'll sync up with the other browsers so that you're not having to put this ampersand in places and all that. So fingers crossed that that goes pretty soon. And so that was the basics I wanted to cover with um, what's in CSS and what can replace SAS. And now, what if you want other SAS-like functionality on your site that might not be in CSS yet? This is where I'm going to talk about some post-CSS, if no one has talked about that before. And if you don't know what post-CSS is, it's a Node.js tool that transpiles your CSS using very, there's a bunch of different plugins you can use that do various, support, various and assorted things. Some of them replicate some of the SAS functionality that the CSS working, is working on right now, but it might not already be a specification and browsers might not support it. Um, so it's kind of like a polyfill. Um, other browser or other plugins replicate existing SAS features or other features that may never be added to the CSS specifications. And then there's some others that are just nice to have, or so kind of fun things to have in your code. And here's some examples of some post-CSS plugins that with some of the future CSS syntax. Some of these might actually be in all modern browsers now. You see I have a post-CSS nesting, which follows the CSS nesting specification. And unfortunately, this is the one that keeps on, keeps on changing. This is the one where Chrome and Firefox do not require the ampersand, but, yeah. but Chrome does. There's post-CSS custom media, which is which is a defines a custom media um, that's a custom media specification. This is actually a way that you can make CSS custom variables for your media your uh, media queries, which is pretty sweet. There's post CSS media min max, and that's the range notation in your media queries. And I actually think this one is supported in all browsers now. But if you need to support older browsers still, then you might want to use this media min max. And then post CSS preset m is a collection of plugins that are all that all have future CSS syntax from the CSS what you do. So it's nothing kind of weird or funky. This one is these are things that are eventually going to be in CSS. And then there are some post-CSS plugins that replicate SAS functionality. These ones, again, may or may not ever make it to the specifications. It's more, I really want to switch away from SAS, but I'm really going to miss some of the stuff <coughs> I really like about SAS. So that's why you see things like post-CSS mixins, which is a way to add mixins to CSS. There's map get, which is also a way to be able to do maps within CSS. Um, there's ways to define functions in CSS using this post-CSS plugin. And then there's post-CSS nested, which is different from post-CSS nesting, where I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides. And then there's a big list of post-CSS plugins from the post-CSS website. These are kind of the wild west. There's like probably some of the ones that are on CSS pre or post-CSS preset M. But there's also some other random ones that do, I think there's ones that like make Benify, like make make all of your selectors using Ben notation. I'm not sure how that one works. I would be a little wary about using some of these because I would think that 
there would have be performance implications for trying to like mess around with, with CSS to make it act like SAS, especially with like mixins and functions and stuff. But I haven't really played with it. You can play with it, and if it works for you, sweet. And then this last one is some post CSS plugins with some useful functionality. Um, like one is P the CSS Nano, which is a way to minify your CSS based on using a post CSS plugin. There's probably other ways to minify your CSS, but if you wanted to do it through a plugin, this is the way to do it. There's post CSS PX to Rem. This is a plugin that will, call, will switch all of your pixel definitions to REMs. That way, if you like writing all of your um, all of your sizes in pixels, you can do that. And then when you run, whenever you compile or whenever you save your site, it'll convert it all to rem, so you're not having to do that rem math. And then lastly, there's post CSS import, which it transforms import rules by inlining styles. I'll give an example of this one in probably a slide or two um, to show you what this one does. So, yeah, there are two plugins, there's post CSS nesting versus post CSS nesting. It was really confusing when I was looking around and seeing what the heck the difference was between these two because they're so they're named so similarly. The first one is um, the nested. It follows the CSS working group, or it follows the SAS specification for the ampersand element. So if you use post CSS nested, you don't have to add the ampersand anywhere at all before your element selector. So it acts exactly how SAS, how, how SAS works now, how SAS nesting works. Whereas post CSS nesting following, follows the CSS working group implementation of the ampersand element. With this one, like you have to add ampersand before um, element selectors in Chrome, but no longer in Firefox or Safari. So it depends on how, what spec you want to follow. I tend, to, I tend to use post CSS nesting because I want to follow the CSS working group recommendations and I'm wanting to not use SAS. But if you're trying to, if you're slowly moving away from SAS, maybe you would use nested just to stick with that same specification. So it's all up to you and it's all up to your project. <clears throat> all right, next one, I've got a couple examples of post CSS in action. I use post CSS on my personal site, which is which is which, is, which runs something called Eleventy. It's like a JavaScript set, static site generator, and I use CSS there. And I also have an example of how post CSS is used in Drupal Ten because there's there's an initiative called the CSS Modernization Initiative that is going on, and we're trying to clean up the CSS um, now that IE support is dropped in Drupal Ten. We'll be able to use custom properties and some other things that are in post CSS. So let me fire up my, my uh, fire up my VS Code here, and I can try and make that a little bit bigger too. Let me fire this up. Close this. Let's this. All right. So this is my, this is an 11e.json file, or 11e.js file. This is where I do a lot of my JavaScript declarations and things like that. Um, in this one, you can see I'm declaring post CSS. I use post CSS nano, let me get that out of here. Post CSS nano to, um, to minify all of my code. I use custom media in here. Um, I use that post CSS import that I was talking about. I use nesting in here still. And I use PX to rem. So this is a, so this is me defining it on the top of my file. And then down here is where all of my um, post CSS stuff is being run. So first off, I am converting all of my pixels to rems, and the prop list of star means I'm converting everything. You can you can limit it if you don't want to like change your margins or anything to rems. You could just put like margin bottom or margin. I need to do more with the logical properties. So if you're using logical properties, you can put them in there too. And then I'm using post CSS import. And I'm using the custom media nesting and then I'm minifying it all at the end. And it all gets spit out in this styles.css, this one right here. 
a dolmenified, and you can see that there's REMS and everything in here. Now I'll go back to what import does. So the way my import is working is that my styles.css in my file, I'm kind of using it like SAS partials, where I've got a bunch of different CSS files that are using the import, and the post CSS import um, plugin will go in and get the get the um, information from every single one of these files and concatenate it all into this one file. Again, this might not be the best thing for me to, for you to use if you are using components and want not don't want all the CSS on every single page. But since this is my blog, I'm just doing it this way. So if this is something you need for your project, this is a good way to kind of do this uh, do the imports here. And then I can show some examples of the custom media, um, the custom media plugin that PostCSS provides. You can see the first three um, examples up here are defining custom properties for small, medium, and large. And I'm using that range notation where the width is greater than or equal to 30 m's. It's small, and then medium, and then large. And then I have places where I'm declaring this. You can see right here on line five, I have media is small, do these things here. So that is a good way to kind of get around the whole not being able to use custom properties in media queries. Is there anything else in here I wanted to show? Um, I don't think so, because I showed nesting already too. So I can get rid of this one. And then I can show you Drupal. Drupal is a little bit different. My 11D, like I can run, I run an NPM script, it's like NPM run build for 11D. And that will like they do all my post CSS stuff. Drupal, you're running yarn. You do like a yarn, yarn build. And the way that Drupal has it all set up is that the, the all of the CSS files are prefaced by a pcss.css, and this is where you run all of your styles. And there are compiles and builds that will compile it and save it into a .css file. It's similar to how JavaScript, when they were doing ES6, where they had the ES6.js files, and you would compile it, and it would just save to a JS. This is similar. So the thing that Drupal uses, Drupal uses is, you can see this is where Drupal is defining their post-CSS. Um, they're also using post-CSS import. Um, they're using a post-CSS URL, which kind of does stuff with normalizing URLs in the project. They're pulling in preset M. And they also are using PX, the PX to rem as well. So you can see that there's a difference in these, um, the pcss.css. You can see that this margin bottom here is 80 pixels. If you go into the layout.css, which is the result after it was built, you can see it's now five rems because it uh, normalized and made the pixels to rems. So this is a big way that we're, that we're modernizing some of the CSS in, in Drupal using, uh, using post-CSS. And hopefully we can do a lot more cleanup in this. Like we're trying to do, use more logical properties and things like that. I wish I had logical properties in this uh, presentation. That's another good thing to talk about, but uh, that's for another time. And you're one, you might be wondering if there are any downsides to using this, because it sounds great. You're able to get all this functionality you want. Like, why would you even ever want to use like SAS at all? You could just do every single one of these things in post-CSS. Well, you might get used to plugins that don't follow CSS specifications. They might just be like the Wild West <laughs> of, I'm just going to make everything pink or whatever. Um, but once those specs get added to the CSS spec, you might have to update your code to follow a quote unquote real specification. And you might have some issues with new developers on your team not really knowing what's going on if you're using older um, plugins or plugins that don't follow a definition. So that might be a reason. Um, if you have too many post CSS plugins, it might affect performance. Like your build time might be a lot slower. Um, your loading your page might be a little bit slower. So that might be something else to look out for is to not have so many of them. <clears throat> setup can be really confusing. As you, as you can see, I've showed two different ways to set up post-CSS. 
I am not, like I said earlier, I am not a JavaScript wizard. I got a lot of help from the internet to get my WebMe set up, and it took a lot of like trial and error. And I assume that when the people working on Drupal 10 who set up the whole CSS stuff initially, there's probably a lot of like banging of heads on walls and stuff to try to get it working because it can be really, really hard. And there's many different ways to do it. You can do it through like Gulf or Grunt, just use NPM scripts, use Yarn. There's not like a one size fits all, like there's not one way to do it, which I guess we're used to in Drupal because that's how Drupal works too. But you know, that might be a thing that if you're just wanting to get something up and running, um, post CSS might be a thing that takes a little bit longer. All right, well, I gave you all this awesome advice. What if you still want to use SAS? Well, you can use some stuff together. There's some stuff that doesn't work together, but you can use SAS and native CSS together if you're not quite ready to move completely off SAS. And this is where I get into some kind of weird esoteric stuff um, where you can use custom properties with SAS variables sometimes. You can't use them in um, the mix function as I showed you earlier, but you can use them for other things. You can use them for other bits of code, and like you'll need to switch to SAS obviously if you're using mix and maps. Um, SAS has also always had its own version of calc, which works with SAS variables. I'm not sure if there's any difference at all between SAS calc and native CSS calc. They kind of do the same thing. Um, I have some like information about Dart SAS and the newer versions of Dart SAS where you don't need to interpolate your SAS variables anymore to use within calc, which you used to have to do. Unfortunately, my examples um, are in CodePen, and CodePen uses an older version of Dart SAS. It uses 1.32.0. So you still need to use you still need to interpolate if you're using CodePen. If you're using like your own project and you have the most up-to-date version of SAS, this wouldn't be a problem. And another good thing about using calc in SAS is that you can get around using that map, using math.div for the division operator in SAS, which has been kind of a huge pain in newer versions of SAS. You know, instead of being able to just use the division sign, you have to do math.div instead. And that's been pretty frustrating. And I have some examples right here. So this is an example of using SAS with custom properties and calc. You can see again here, I've got two variables, um, a background color and a container width. I set them in the root, and then since I'm using SAS, I have the background color and the width uh, being uh, set as the custom properties. And these will work in here. So I have background color set to be background color. And the background color here is like a gray. As you can see up here, I have it set to be DDD, which is a gray. And then I have a width of calc. You know, container width divided by two. And this um, pound sign with the curly brackets, that's the interpolation that I was talking about earlier. And since this is an older version of SAS, I still have to add that to this. But if this was a newer version of SAS, I could just do container width divided by two this way. I wouldn't have to do the like the pound curly bracket, the curly braces thing. But you can see it's not working because CodePen doesn't support that. So I'll go back to putting that there and it will go back to the width that it was at. I think those are pretty much the only things I wanted to show there. Okay. All right, so now we are at the question, should you use SAS in 2023? You're probably gonna guess what my answer is going to be. It depends. It depends on what you what you want to do. So here are some reasons why you still want to use SAS and or still would need to use SAS or want to use SAS in 2023. Not going anywhere. So there's no like there's no urgency to get off of it because support is going to end next year or anything like that. Uh, so you can still use it as much as you like. It, you might not feel like native CSS is caught up to where SAS is yet, that there's still a lot of functionality you like in SAS that I'm going to miss this if I go to native CSS. If you have, if your code base has a lot of mix-ins functions, like a lot of complications like that, that are necessary for your application, you want to keep using SAS too. 
If you're supporting a lot of old browser versions, like you still for some reason have to support IE 11, uh, hopefully no one has to yet anymore, you might want to still use SAS to get some functionality. And then yeah, updating your code base to remove SAS, which is, it's, a, it's effort that you don't really want to take on. And I'll blame you. And then use SAS if you want to. Like, I'm not stopping you, no one's stopping you. Keep on using it. All right, so wrapping up. It's a great time to be a front end developer with all the new additions to CSS that I talked about. Mainly custom properties have been fantastic. I've been super, super happy with being able to like update variables on the fly without having to use SAS. Um, the math func functions have been great. Uh, the color functions, like all the color options have been awesome. I really do want to explore more of the color spaces that are out there now, like OKLCH and things like that. And it's really great that nesting is, is in um, CSS. Granted, you don't want to like over overuse it and over nest things because that also uh, causes a lot of performance problems. But having the functionality in general in SAS, I think, is pretty great. You can also use post CSS to enhance native CSS if you decided to go with just native CSS. You can add CSS that might not be supported in all modern browsers that are that's coming from the CSS working group. You can add functionality that SAS supports right now, um, like mixes, mixes and functions. And you can add some nice to haves like converting pixels to rems and minifying your CSS. And you can use SAS with modern CSS if you want to gradually switch your code base, but you should still use SAS if you want to. I have some um, <coughs> articles with further reading, with some spicy takes from some people. Like the first one up here, if you can't read it, is is it time to drop SAS? So that one's another like hot take there. And then the second one is do not drop SAS for CSS. So you want to read like the differing views of why you should or shouldn't do it. I think these people go into spicier takes than me. And then there's a bunch of other like, oh, this is my experience going back to CSS. Um, Here's some, some information about mixing your colors with CSS. So yeah, a bunch of, bunch of really good articles to read if you want to read more. Again, here's some more information about me if you want to follow me online. I do post a lot on Macedon, so if you're on Macedon, feel free to follow me. And that's it. Ta-da! <laughs> And is there any questions? Yep. What happens if you do really bad nesting in the case of native CSS? I know some of the bad things that happen with SAS. I'm curious what would happen in this case. Like what happens if it's like if it's overly nested? Yeah. Yeah. The question is, what happens if you're overly nest nest native CSS like we see sometimes in SAS? I think the same thing would happen. I think the performance implications. Honestly, I think the performance implications would be even worse because it's the browser doing all the calculations um, for the nesting and not just, I guess it is still doing the calculation when it's CSS, when it's, no, it's not, yeah. It would, it would, it would probably be worse because it's calculating on the fly in the browser. So that's why, like, if you're nesting, I probably wouldn't nest more than just one. Like, I like nesting, like, my hover state and my other states for my links. Those are, like, pretty much the only things I'll nest. Um, but if you're nesting like everything, yeah, I think you're going to have a lot of problems. How do you quantify The question was, how do you know about the performance implications? I mean, yeah, you would look in your network, you would look probably the network tab and see stuff in there. You'd probably notice it if your page is loading slow and things like that. Um, so it would be like big things like that that you would notice. Yep, okay. I don't know if you mentioned those partials because what I like about SAS is keeping keeping my first and all. If I want to style the Yep. So the question was, is import so is import supported in uh, native CSS? It actually isn't supported in native CSS, but there was that post CSS plugin, that post CSS import plugin, and that way you can do it. I can go back and show that here. That was actually I'll show it in my code because I have it in my code. 
Um, if I go to here, the styles.css right here, I have all of my CSS files being imported, and then they all get compiled. Like in my post CSS plugin, it'll get every it'll get the um, the contents of every single one of these CSS files and put it all in here, and then I use CSS Nano to unify it all. So yeah, my result is this. So unify and import everything. All right, lots of questions. All right, uh, who's first? Um, What's the scope of a variable as compared to the CSS file? Is it the whole site? Is it just that file? Uh, the question is, what's the scope that's in the CSS file? And yeah, it's since I'm not using any sort of CSS scoping or anything like that, yeah, it would be global throughout your entire site. So again, like the import that I showed you right there, you'd probably only want to use it if you're sure that you want all the styles on every single page. It's not really scoped to anywhere. <laughs> all right. Uh, you? Yes, I'm just wondering your thoughts about um, BEM. Um, I remember working on a project where they used that. The, um, the thing that was working on that project, I used it a lot, so I. I, I used it once or twice, and I don't, I don't see a lot of people using it anymore. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Uh, question was, what do I think about them, um, the lock element modifier? I actually really like using it, and I actually still use it. Yeah, I feel like it is kind of falling a little more out of favor um, with ways that other people are writing CSS, especially with scoping and things like that. It's not being used as much. I like it even though it can be cumbersome with all the like underlines and, or like the um, underscores and the dashes and what's, when, to use what, when to use what, where, and things like that, and it might look ugly. But I still like it because it is still pretty easy for me to see stuff. But, okay. Yeah. Right. So I guess I'm trying to justify in my head why I wouldn't use SAS, right? Because it seems like if I don't use SAS, if I move like the nesting, I don't even think about the nesting to be mentioned. If I move the nesting to CSS, that's a potential performance issue. So why? I probably just want to stay with SAS. But if I do move away from SAS, I probably need more post CSS stuff, which is a post -pro or a pre processor. So, like, I don't understand why there, why is there a movement to move away from SAS at this point? Because it seems like SAS solves a lot of problems, but if we move away from it, we're just introducing new problems. Yep. The question. So like, what's the argument for? There you go. That's the short version. Yeah. The question is, what's the argument for for moving away from SAS? And some of it is like some of it's I want to just keep my code base really clean and not have a lot of external dependencies. Granted, if you're using post CSS, you're adding you're adding the dependencies that way. I guess it depends on what you're using for your site. Like, if, like I said earlier, if you're using a lot of mixins and um, functions and things like that, yeah, you should definitely still use SAS. Maybe you have a pretty like basic code base. You don't have a lot of nesting in there. Uh, you might not even need to use a lot of the post CSS plugins because a lot of the ones I did cover actually um, are supported in all browsers now. If you're only wanting to support the most modern browsers, you wouldn't need any of the post CSS plugins to fill in like to support older browsers. So yeah, like I said, it depends on what you have. I mean, it's not hurting anything to stay with SAS, but if you just wanted to get rid of like the dependencies that SAS has, and you don't need any of the post CSS dependencies, then it probably makes sense. I have a really quick follow-up. Yeah, yeah. So some of like, the new CSS features that you send into just release to the entire box and curl, whatever. Like, what's a good rule of thumb? Like, if that was, if there was like nesting was is now available, or I forget what the details were like, yesterday. Mm -hmm. What's a good rule of thumb where you, you would assume that that is like, everyone or a high enough percentage of people have that updated before you don't have to rely on CSS or SAS or anything like that? Is it yeah. a year, or two years? Yeah, the follow up is um, what happens when the specs change and when you actually drop using post CSS on things. Yeah, I think that's going to depend individually on your project. Like, how much, if, if you're getting a lot of traffic from Firefox, like, you might want to keep the post CSS for a little bit longer. But if it's like you have five people who visited on Firefox in like a year or something, maybe, because it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to make your site unusable. It's just, oh, this like one nesting thing, like the color might be different or something, depending on how you write it. So, yeah, it's just going to depend on, it, it, like, like the answer for everything in, in development, it depends. <laughs> so there's a lot of, it's a lot of context. So 
Yeah, so I don't have a better answer for that, but it's a, it's a hard problem to solve, especially knowing when to drop support for things. It's the same with like browsers too. Like when you drop, how many versions of browsers like behind you support, things like that, when you drop like CSS, like or maybe Firefox 14, 114. Yeah, it's really hard to tell. We're out of time. Oh, yeah. All right, I think that's it.